Good morning, Sunshines. It's good to see you. You have made it another week. I'm glad you're here. Blah, 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 blah. There's Joanne Gray. Hi, Joanne. How are you? Do you want to dance? Let's just. Oh, okay. There you go. This is being recorded, so don't say anything too terrible. I did see what she did to Jim. This is week number five, I think, of our journey into the unseen realm. We have done a lot of weird stuff already. Um, so far, you haven't lynched me, but maybe this is the week. Who knows? We can hope. Uh, and we have a lot of territory to cover in this class. We're talking about a lot of different things. This is your first week with us. We've been exploring uh, just the concept that there's an entire world that we cannot see. Uh, we've been talking about what's really going on behind the idols of the Old Testament, the, the demonic that lurks. But my absolute favorite thing about this class has been the conversations I've had with you before and after and the really crazy stories you have told me. And what's amazing about the stories is all of you tell me the stories the same way. You say, now don't think I'm crazy, but, or don't tell anyone this, but, or, and I'm getting close to 50% of you having told me strange stories of things that don't quite fit into the boxes that we're used to. Uh, and so I know that uh, experiential uh, anecdotal evidence is sometimes kind of a dangerous thing when you study something, you know. Just because somebody has an experience doesn't mean that they interpreted that experience correctly, recounted that experience correctly, et cetera, et cetera. But when, uh, when half the church starts to tell you stories, it kind of makes you go, hmm, maybe we've overlooked something here. Maybe there's something important to talk about here. We're going to do some more of that later. I'd, I kind of want to spend maybe our last week of this class, the, the last part of this quarter, just opening up to telling stories, but I'm afraid half of you are going to have heart attacks, so I'm not real sure what to do with that. Okay, uh, Dennis is going to start us off with a prayer because he gets to be here today, and then we'll get going. Dennis, pray for us. about is there's more going on than we can see. That's why this class is the Unseen Realm. So Eric's going to start us off with a song that is a great prayer for this study. Hit it, Eric. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. No, that's the wrong song. <laughs> hey, the Lord told me to start with that song. Yeah. So, so y'all should have followed Well, the Lord told you that, but the PowerPoint told you this one. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. concept divine geography. I know that sounds kind of weird. Most of you haven't had geography since like seventh grade or whatever year in middle school you had that. But there is this concept um, that there are uh, places that are different. Uh, there is contested territory in the world. And last week we talked a lot about thin places, those places where it seems like heaven and earth are just a smidge closer. Um, and I think it's not an accident in scripture how often meetings with God happen on top of mountains. 
Not because God is literally up high and we're down low, but there's something about that rarefied air, that rarefied spot uh, where we see these things. Here's some of the stuff we've talked about. We've talked about Genesis 6 and the possibility of angels or spirits or something. Consorting, do you like that euphemism? It's a really good euphemism. Uh, with humans and producing this lineage of destruction, it was weird stuff. Uh, but the cool thing about that possible uh, interpretation of Genesis 6 is it might explain where the giants of the Old Testament came from. That would be why Goliath was so spooky. It wasn't just that he was shack tall. It, it was that his family was truly from something evil uh, that should not have been. Uh, and being tall is certainly problematic too. Uh, it might explain the need why in the Old Testament God gives the command to annihilate entire people groups because perhaps they are fully contaminated by this sort of demonic influence. It might explain some of the ancient stories of the demigods like the titans and things like that if there are uh, demonic forces that work on the earth. Then last week we talked briefly about Babel. Uh, and most of us are used to just thinking about the Babel being the place where there is a scattering of the languages, right? You know, but remember what they were trying to do. They were trying to ascend to God or the gods with this tower they were building. They were trying to resist his command to spread throughout the earth. Uh, but when you read this Deuteronomy 32 passage, there's this really interesting line that says that he, he scattered them according to the number of the sons of, the sons of Elohim, the sons of God, which sounds like when he scattered the people, it's almost like he scattered them and he said, let's see, I've got 37 of these spirit beings, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put them in 37 places and see what happens. And that opens the door to this idea that there might be um, spirits over certain areas of the planet or, or demons in certain areas of the planet. I'm not really sure about all the details. I'm just trying to say, here's some possibilities for you. But that idea also has a lot of explanatory power. Uh, it makes some of those phrases about the gods of the present age make sense. That this demon is the demon of Philadelphia. <laughs> I mean, maybe not Philadelphia, but uh, you know, all of these places listed in the table of nations in Genesis 10. Uh, maybe this explains how Satan could offer Jesus his kingdoms. You remember that temptation in Matthew 4? I always thought that's a strange temptation. How in the world can Satan do that? Well, what if Satan has 12 demon buddies, and one of them is the one who's behind all the things going on in the Middle East, and one of them's behind all the things going on in Washington, D.C., and one of them's behind all the things going on in Jim and Joanne's house. And Satan's like, hey, I'll call my three buddies here, and they'll give you their stuff. Uh, maybe that's an interpretation of that. Maybe not. Just floating some things for you to take a look at. It also uh, explains part of the significance of Israel's mission. Israel was supposed to be the place, the light to the nations, the fresh water to the world. They were supposed to be the place that was truly God's territory. And that's what makes it so very bad when they invite evil into their territory. It, it's not just the wrong that they do. It's the wrong that they do while they're supposed to be something entirely different. Okay, it's really bad if someone beats someone to a pulp, right? Go like this. Go like this, okay? If not, I'm gonna need some help in the parking lot today. Uh, it's bad if someone beats somebody to bolt, but isn't it a whole lot worse if you put up a sign that says emergency room and you walk through the door and the guy's waiting behind the door to beat you to a pulp? <laughs> because this is the place you went for healing and help and instead you found ambush and attack. Israel was supposed to be the place of healing for the world. It was supposed to be God's headquarters on earth. And so when Israel invites the prophets of Baal in, Asherah and Dagon and all of these other gods, they have taken the emergency room, the, the place of God's healing on earth, and turned it into this, this mockery, this insult. And that's, that's what takes the bad thing and makes it so, so much, so much badder, so much worse. That's what's going on in some of those stories. Let me show you a couple of Old Testament stories that kind of fit with this. Um, a lot of our stories come from 1 and 2 Kings. There's just a lot that goes on there. This is 1 Kings 20, and it's another story where we encounter um, the Syrians. Uh, these are stories that maybe you picked up in Sunday school. These are stories that a lot of us have forgotten since Sunday school. Um, I told you the story already about the time when uh, the Syrians got real ticked off because God was telling everything that uh, the king of Syria did in his bedroom to the prophets. You remember, you remember that story, and we had to open our eyes story to see all those who were with us versus all those who were with them. This is, again, a king of Syria's story. Servants of the king of Syria said to him, 
speaking about Israel, their gods are gods of the hills. So that's why they were stronger than us. So here's what we're going to do. We'll fight them in the plain, and then we're going to win. Sounds like a great plan, doesn't it? Well, they listen to the plan. They do it. You go to the next slide, verse 26. Ben-Hadad musters his troops. They go up to fight against Israel. And what happens? The people of Israel encamped before them like two little flocks of goats, but the Syrians filled the country. And a man of God came near and said to the king of Israel, by the way, a man of God, that's a, that's a strange, un, um, uh, it, it's a, a pronoun without an antecedent. It's, it's an ambiguous reference right here. A man of God came near and said to the king of Israel, Thus says the Lord, because the Syrians have said, The Lord is a God of the hills, he is not a God of the valleys. Therefore, I will give this great multitude into your hand, and you will know that I am the Lord. They camped opposite one another seven days. On the seventh day, the battle was joined. Was joined? That even is strange language, isn't it? It sounds like I would say they started the battle, but they joined the battle. Was there a battle going on already they didn't know about or couldn't see? I mean, that fits the other things I've told you, doesn't it? The battle was joined, and the people of Israel struck down to the Syrians. You see that number? I know it's small, but some of you still have good eyes. 100,000 foot soldiers in one day. Uh, and then, after that, they retreated. They went into the city of Aphek, and what happened to 27,000 men? The wall fell on them. Now, I don't know that preachers are supposed to quote the Final Destination series of movies, <laughs> but that's kind of what I'm about to do. Uh, kind of the series of movies where death is really out to get somebody. That's what's happening here. When you escape from battle and you're like, I'm back home, and then the wall falls on you, that's, that's God wanted you dead. <laughs> okay, and that's what happens in this text. But I want you to go back to, did you see how the Israelites were described? Like two little flocks of goats. <laughs> and then what happens? They kill 100,000 and the wall takes out 27,000. There's stuff going on that you can't see. But the reason I'm sharing you this text with you it kind of seems like God is particularly offended that the Syrians portray him as a god of the hills and not of the valleys. Uh, it seems like it really bothers him that they don't understand that he is the one who is actually everywhere. But their conception of deity is localized deity. That, that deity exists. There's hill gods, there's plain gods, there's coast gods, there's sea gods, there's Joanne gods. There's all of these different things. So this is a big part of the thinking you run into in the Old Testament. Let me show you one more example of... Uh, Divine geography in the Old Testament. 2 Kings chapter 5. Do you remember the story of Naaman the Syrian? Now that's a good BBS story, right? Because we get to baptize that dude like seven times and it's a lot of fun. He is the guy who has leprosy. You remember him? And he's like, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. You remember, you remember that story? And what happens to intercede to save him? You remember this? Oh, nobody's going to get a Bible book today if you don't get this right. Carolyn's going to be so disappointed in you. Remember he has this little servant girl who says, hey, there's this guy back in Israel. He does some cool stuff. You should check him out and send a message. Send the prophet. Remember this story? He says, hey, go dunk yourself in the river seven times. He says, I got rivers back home. This is dumb. Why would I go dunk in your river? And he says, wouldn't you listen to me if I told you to do something spectacular? Just go do it. You remember that story? And at the end of that story in 2 Kings 5, he is incredibly grateful. Here's what he says. Naaman says, behold, I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. But in Israel. You notice that phrasing? He says, the only God of all the earth is the God who lives over here. So notice what he does. Uh, uh, he, he wants to give a gift to the prophet, and the prophet's not taking it. Uh, then Naaman says, all right, fine. Here's all I want from you. Can I have two mule loads, mule loads, mule loads of dirt, dirt, earth? <laughs> Y'all try teaching. It's not easy to do. Give me two truckloads of dirt. Huh? And what does he do with that? He wants to bring it home so that when he prays, he prays in Israel while he's in Syria. Huh? Now, again, I'm, I'm inclined to say because Scripture teaches us that God is everywhere. doesn't matter what dirt you're standing on. But in the ancient world, that was not the way people thought. They had this idea that there was a God here and a God there and a God everywhere. And he, it's funny that God doesn't say, you dummy, you can pray wherever you want. He says, all right, take some dirt and pray. Just not the same sort of thinking that we're thinking about. Questions, comments here? 
I know I'm kind of doing a tour de force of weird Old Testament stories, but I think it's kind of useful because it recalibrates us to some of the things that we're going to talk about. All right, here's what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about some terms. There are a lot of words that we throw around that we don't actually know what they mean. Um, what are seraphim? Cherubim? Angels? Okay. What were the Nephilim? We talked about them a little bit last week. That was this Genesis 6 passage. And you see this idea that they are giant-ish. In this passage is notoriously hard to translate. I put it up on the screen right now in the New English translation. I, I think they did a really good job with it uh, over and above the ESV. But each translation is a little bit different. Um, are these the beings that were the sons of God who came to the daughters of men? Were these the results of that? Not really sure of how all of that works. But what you get is they become the heroes of old. The famous men or, or the mighty men uh, in these texts. So, who are they? What are they? Well, what I get from this text is they're, they're giants or, and I like this language, semi-divine. That's the, that's the word I'm going to use for spirit beings. They're above us, but they're not God. Okay, so semi-divine is the word I'm going to use. They appear in the pre-flood and early conquest period. They're really strong, and that's all I know for sure. Basically, they show up in these uh, two passages, Genesis 6, I just showed you in Numbers 13. Here's the Numbers 13 passage. Okay, the Nephilim, and then you have this parenthetical, the sons of Anak, who come from the Nephilim. So there's some connection to the sons of Anak. Let me give you a short Hebrew lesson, by the way. If you see a word in Hebrew, generally it ends in a consonant. Generally, that is uh, the singular of that word. I'm making some really broad brushes, uh, broad strokes here. And if you see that same word with I-M on the end of it, it's usually the plural of that thing. So there is a cherub. What is the plural of a cherub? <coughs> cherub beam, okay? Um, so uh, what's, uh, what's the plural of it? A seraph. Seraph beam, okay. Yeah, and, and you can do this in a lot of different places. In a lot of, not always, it doesn't always work like this, but it's, for today it works. <laughs> so we're gonna use it for today. Um, so. You have the sons of Anak. What might we call them? The, try, try it, it's, it's really hard. You're gonna stick an I-M on the end of Anak, and you're gonna say, Anakim? Okay. So, uh, by the way, this Numbers 13 passage is funny. Uh, do you know the context of this? Do you remember when we send the spies into Canaan? Remember the 12 spies? They go to look at the land God's gonna give them, and they say, Whoa, man, the fruit is so big. And there's so much food, and the fields are so great. It's the land flowing with milk and honey, but there's one tiny problem. The people who live there, and here's the line in Numbers 13, 33, we seemed like grasshoppers next to them. What if, the text is kind of hinting at, what if some of the people who lived in this land were the descendants, like the text is telling you, of these giants, of these demigods. You know, when I read this passage in Numbers 13 and I thought about the 12 spies going to Canaan, usually I kind of shake my finger at them and say, oh, you guys are so faithless. Okay, yeah, they were strong, you know, but come on, you've taken on Egyptian armies, you've taken on Philistines, what's the big deal? But I'm actually a little bit more sympathetic to those faithless spies when I think about the idea that the land might have been populated with evil demonic giants. Okay, I don't actually want to take that land. Thank you very much. We'll stay over here in Memphis because it's a lot safer is what they're basically saying. That, that's right here. But in this text, there's a connection between the Nephilim and the Anakim. So let me take you back here. If you go to Deuteronomy chapter 2, verses 10 to 11, you find that there is a connection between the Amim, the Anakim, the Rephaim, and the Zazumim. Your hearts are a flutter right now, aren't they? You're thinking, I'm so glad I decided to come to Sunday school today. What I'm telling you is, there are a lot of these people in these clans, but they're all associated with the geographic area that Israel was called to conquer and take over. That's worth remembering. 
there's a couple of other things that I want to make sure that you know too. When your Bible gives you the word Nephilim, um, it's not <coughs> translating that word, it's transliterating that word. Uh, do you know what I mean when I say that? Okay, translation is, I, I don't know. I, David, you know Spanish, right? Um, you were on the phone with me while you were in Mexico one time, and I started looking things up on Google Translate to try to yell to see if the people on speakerphone would do. <laughs> it could have been really fun, but he was smart enough to mute me, I think. <laughs> so uh, I, I don't know. Give me, a good, give me a good Spanish word. What's Spanish for cheese? Cheese. Cheese. Queso, Queso right? Uh, Susan agreed, so it must be true. Uh, if, <laughs> if I want to go to the Mexican place and I want cheese dip, I say, Queso for the gringo. Por favor. No, no, no. I say, can I have some cheese dip, please? That's what, what you should say. Uh, but you know the word queso means cheese. Um, that's how we kind of translate queso means cheese. So if, if you saw a menu and it had queso listed and you were translating it into English, you would put what word there? Cheese. Cheese. But let's say you didn't know the English word for cheese. And it's your job to translate the menu and you encounter this word, what do you do then? What'd you say? A similar word. Similar word, but how do you know what the similar word is if you don't know what it means, Roy? Yes. Yeah, that's a problem, isn't it? <laughs> you can say what it comes from, like, hey, I recognize this. <laughs> cow, rotten cow juice. <laughs> wow, I just really ruined cheese dip for a while. <laughs> that's a shame. I do want to know who the first guy who invented cheese was. That was some messed up dude. It's all I, all I can figure out. Uh, so, you know, I can look for something that sort of describes it. But if, if I'm reading, if I, if I dig up this book, okay, and I open to a random page, and this thing's in Spanish, and I see this word queso, and I'm like, they dipped their chips in queso. I know all the other words, but queso, uh, in fact, that's what I just did. I didn't translate. I just picked up the word from Spanish, and I said it in English. So that happens in all sorts of places. There are places where we don't know what the word is, so rather than translating it, we just say the Hebrew word, we say the Spanish word. Nephilim is one of these words. We don't know what that word means. So we pick it up out of Hebrew, and we just repeat it. Now, for what it's worth, when the Greeks were, when the, the Old Testament was being translated into Greece, Greek, ugh, words are hard, I didn't get enough sleep last time. When the Old Testament was being translated from Hebrew into Greek, they chose to translate the word Nephilim. And I'll tell you what Greek word they translated it with, and I bet you can guess what it means. Gigantes. Giant. You hear it? Giant. That was how they chose to translate it. And, and so they did, I forget who said it, the technique of trying to find something similar or comparable. Because they didn't really know what to do with it either. So they went with, oh yeah, these are the men of renown. These are the strong guys. But let me tell you that uh, Nephilim is not a translation. It's a, it's a transliteration. That's what it means when you take each letter and just find the equivalent in the next language. Here are what, uh, here's what Anita said. Here are the things that sound like this word in Hebrew. Okay? It sounds like the Hebrew root that means to fall. So this might mean the fallen ones. Hmm? Well, what does that mean? Well, here's some choices. Uh, angels who fell? Is it referring to fallen people? Is it referring to hostile warriors who fall upon a city, you know, like an attack? Or people who have died? Is this referring to dead people? The Nephilim are dead people. This is a Bruce Willis movie. I see dead people. Uh, or, or is this the response that describes how terrifying they were? Because when people see them, boom, they fall. Like when people see angels in the Bible. Uh, those, are, those are just some of the possibilities. Okay, to fall sounds like the word for nephel in Hebrew. The second one, miscarriage. Is if that word weren't triggering enough, some of the commentaries and dictionaries actually put the word abort right there. So there's a group of commentators who see that this word might be mangled, aborted children. Okay, And then the third word that sort of sounds like this word in Hebrew is just the word that means extraordinary. Like, and they're extraordinary, as you know, extraordinarily tall or strong or scary or something like that. So what I'm showing you right now is helping you exactly this much. <laughs> what I'm telling you is uh, we have struggled with this concept, 
actually for thousands of years we have struggled with what to do with some of these texts. But these are the ideas that a Hebrew speaker would have had floating around in their head when they heard Nephilim. Does that sound scary? Does that sound big? I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I need to, to work on this a little bit more. I told you the Septuagint translates this as is, uh, giants, although there's some variants that call this violent men. There's another thing that I notice when I look up all of the references to these people in Scripture. They all die in Scripture at the hands of Joshua and David. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? David is that great king of Israel. Joshua is the one who, who brings us into this conquest of Canaan. But what do I take from that? Well, here's my answer with the Nephilim. I don't know. Because I can't get solid scripture evidence. I have now shown you 120% of the evidence scripture has to offer. I've shown you the evidence that Hebrew linguistics has to offer. And basically, in showing you this chart, I have shown you what church history has to offer. And we just, we don't know. So I go back to where we were last week. It seems like there is some sort of consorting between these sons of Elohim, these daughters of men, and there is this race of broken, mixed up, bad, evil, demonic, whatever people. And they're powerful and they're strong, and they are a real threat in this divine geography. They must be eliminated because they're so dangerous. Well, this explains why why God would order the destruction of an entire group of people, including men, women, and children? Could. Would it explain why God is protecting a bloodline from these? Jerry, what you thinking? They must have been good swimmers if they lived through the flood. <laughs> yeah, uh, so that's a good question in Genesis 6. Are they good swimmers if they lived through the flood? And one of the Genesis 6, 4 things makes it sound like this thing that happened might have happened more than once. So that's kind of a thing to keep in mind. It, it, it may have been a a repeated story. Job kind of gives us that reference that they come back in hope. So if there is this idea that they have fallen as in they have already died, it's kind of hard to kill dead things, isn't it? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Some people are terrified. Yeah! Twelve spies feared death of them, said to God. Exactly. It's funny. On one hand, I'm not wanting you to be too sympathetic to the 12 spies because we're supposed to learn from the other two who were faithful. But at the same time, I want you to understand the 12 spies legit were afraid. It wasn't just these were some burly guys in the town. This was, yeah. you know, this is, this is something. And even if you take the most conservative position on this, the most least Least scary, you're talking about guys who the Bible says are 10 feet tall. These aren't ordinary people, no matter what you do with this text. This is legitimately super scary. And remember, we're not going into war with rifles and missiles. We're going into hand-to-hand -hand combat with swords. You think it matters if the guy you're going against is twice your size? It really matters. You know, a gun is a pretty good leveler. You know, I can be a small guy with a gun and do pretty good to fight. But when you're going against a guy with a rock and a stick, the big guy's got some advantages. So... Anywho, anything else you want to say here? Roy? There's a question. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> were, were any of these tall people, whatever people, ever the good guy? Were they always, in every context you found, always the bad guy, the bad guy, the bad guy, the bad guy, the bad I'm not aware of a time they were the good guy. If I'm wrong, tell me about it next week, okay? I don't think there's ever a context where they're on the right side of the battle. It's kind of lends the idea that they're not good. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, let me take you somewhere else. You have sung this song, and Eric's going to sing the right one this time. No pressure, Eric. Um, you sung this song, and you don't know what it's talking about. So let's try it. This is holy, 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 Eric. <laughs> holy, holy, holy.
of the covenant. All right, cherubim sure. show up on the ark of the covenant. Good. What are they? The portal of cherubim. Do what? They have wings. So they have wings. Angelic beings. Angelic beings. The plural of cherub and seraph. They are the plural of cherub and seraph. You remembered something from 12 minutes ago. It's the most exciting moment of my life. <laughs> Not they, but which one? I know the feeling. <laughs> There's more pollen in the air than actual uh, oxygen today. So here's. Here is every time in the Bible that a cherub or cherubim show up. Uh, if you want the list, take a picture of the list. Um, I'm just curious. Those of you who are super good Bible scholars should probably just look at the list and confer some things. Is there anything you can tell from looking at that list? The warriors. Warriors? Maybe. Old Testament. Old Testament. There is one New Testament reference. That's interesting. It's in that New Testament reference is in Hebrews, which is the most Old Testament book of the New Testament, and it is in that passage referring to one of these other passages. They're in the garden. Okay, that's where Joanne started us. Well, they're not so much in the garden. They're on the edge of the garden, right? He drove out the man to the east of the garden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword. That turned, wait, the, the flaming sword is its own thing? It doesn't say the cherubim were swinging it. It says the sword that turns every way. Woo! Okay, we've got a lot to do here, don't we? Um, and I'm not going to be able to do hardly any of it. So, in this passage, what is the, go- the job of the cherubim? Guarding. Guarding. They are door guards. Okay? Uh, I'm going to take you on a representative survey of all of those passages I just showed you. So, buckle up, get ready. Um, Exodus 25. Uh, stare at the screen. When you know what this passage is talking about, just yell it. This is instructions for building the Ark of the Covenant. That's what I think Jerry mentioned. Uh, where are where are the chairmen? The kind of the covering it, standing watch over it with their wings atop it. Based on the two concepts I've shown you so far, what are the chairs doing here? Yeah, right. Very right. information. Guarding it. If anybody got one, Carolyn's looking for two of them going for all. Yes, uh, Carolyn has an Ark of the Covenant downstairs, and it weirds me out a little bit every time I see it because I've read the Old Testament and I've watched Indiana Jones. <laughs> you know, I'm like, Carolyn, cover that thing up. You know, I don't want to die when I go into your classroom. So uh, I do occasionally touch it just to make sure it's not real, you know, and I'm still. <laughs> That'd be a great time for me to have a heart attack, wouldn't it? Uh, okay, so it looks like the cherubim are guarding or standing watch over it. Okay, Exodus 26. Uh, similar context. What's going on here? What are we talking about? The curtain. The curtain is what? Tabernacle. Right, okay. Um, okay, this one's a little bit different. This is uh, in... Uh, 2 Samuel 22, 8. This is when uh, David is singing this song of deliverance about how God rescued him from Saul. Um, the earth rock and roll. No, really rocked. Uh, maybe that's where rock and roll comes from. I don't know. Foundations of the heavens trembled and quaked because he was angry. Smoke went from his nostrils, devouring fire from his mouth. Glowing coals flamed forth from him. He bowed the heavens and came down. Thick darkness was under his feet. He, he did what? God rode a cherub to battle. Huh? What normally gets ridden into battles? So not like Shetland ponies? No, not, not the Lord's army of guinea pigs? No? So you bring in, God is riding the cherub into battle. How does that fit with the image of him as protectors? If I were going to just take this concept and translate it, please, I, I, I mean no irreverence here. The cherubim are God's guard dogs? Isn't that sort of what this sounds like? God's war horses? God's dragons? But we don't believe in dragons. So, oops. 
<laughs> Pegasus, okay, you know, uh, you got something here. By the way, uh, this was not just a tabernacle. Uh, I'm skipping over all these verses because I can show them to you if you want. Verse 2 6, this is the temple. This image survives when we build the temple. Same sort of thing. Uh, Psalm 80. There's just so many of these things. So, what did the cherubim do in Scripture? By the way, they're on the curtain that is the entryway into the temple. They were on the edge of Eden. They were over the, the, the Ark of the Covenant. What are cherubim? They're, they're God's bodyguards. Yeah, the Lord's present when they're around. Yeah. Now, does God need a bodyguard? God doesn't need a bodyguard. One of my favorite things is when you see, like, um, you know, the, the beast of football players, and they have a bodyguard who's smaller than them. Like, you know, I'm not sure you really need that guy, but it's, it's, it's sort of about the principle, right? It's their job to solve the problems before they get to the big guy. I think that's actually a pretty good image. And Drew just used this phrase, not just bodyguard, because, again, God's not going to be hurt, but God's honor should be protected, right? That's kind of a different idea. Um, so what did cherubim do? This is um, from the Lexham Bible Dictionary. Cherubim served as the traditional guardians of sacred spaces in ancient Near Eastern iconography. It is a strange mashup of creatures when you read, see them in art and history and things like that. By the way, does that give an entirely new concept to guardian angel? Because when people think about the idea of a guardian angel, they think about it. Oh, you just don't want to think about it. Make sure I don't try too fast. But in these passages, here are the guardian angels. They're the guys with the earpiece and the guns and the bigger guns and the bigger guns and the bigger guns for God. Now, again, there's all sorts of wrong places you can go with this, but does God need protection? Well, not in that sense, but what does it say about God that he has an entourage who are interested in defending his honor in his space? David? Well, very simple definition in the all of Wikipedia. Yeah. It hits it right. The angels closest to God. The angels closest to God. The inner circle. That's right. The protectors. That's interesting, isn't it? So, okay, we talked about Nephilim. We talked it's about a warning. warning. It's a warning. It's a warning. Make sure you don't cross this line. I mean, it's for our good, not God's. It's, I like what you said. Did you hear that? It's not to protect God, it's to protect us from God. It is a designator that this is where holy space begins. Remember, this is holy ground. Watch out. Don't enter this place unless you're prepared. Unless you, because God is so holy, other than you can't be in this space. That's really good. Okay, I'm going to take two or three more minutes. Look, the sermon is short today, so I can go along in Sunday school. And if you don't like it, you can teach next quarter. Um, I, I want to go from Nephilim to Cherubim to Seraphim. Seraphim are interesting because well, I gave you this list of cherubim passages. But if you just hit Control F with a little magnifying glass in your Bible app and you search for seraphim, you are basically going to find this. This is Isaiah chapter 6. It is the scene where Isaiah is commissioned as a prophet. The year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne high and lifted up the train of his robe, filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings, he covered holy, holy, holy. Then the seraphim flew to, uh, to Isaiah, they did this weird thing with coal and burned his lips as a way of atoning for him so that Isaiah was now a suitable person to announce the glory of God. This is the only passage in your English Bible that you see the word Sarah. What do you get from this passage about Sarah? Did you say creepy? <laughs> Jennifer's the best. She said creepy. <laughs> and creepy is really fair this passage. Yeah, what else do you see? Like a servant, kind of like a hand servant kind of thing. You know, we're, we're right there in the court. They're, they're, they're doing the king's bidding. Say that again, I'm sorry. Uh, like, the, like the spokesman for the court. Okay, that, that's something. Um, messengers, and that's our traditional word for angel is messenger. Um, here's what's interesting. The Hebrew, seraphim, shows up in several other texts where it is not translated. Because when you and I hear the word seraphim, we think about the Lord's seraphim in his heavenly court. Remember sometimes words show up in some unexpected places? Is an article here important? Maybe, maybe not. The seraphim? 
Not sure. The yeah. one that stood above? Here is this one, this particular one. Let me show you this. This is a list of every time that word shows up in the Old Testament. Are you surprised that there is more than this particular page? I'll show you the interesting ones. Numbers 21, 6. Then the Lord sent... Fiery serpents among the people, they bit the people, and the people died. Was that where you were expecting this to go? Deuteronomy 8, we're retelling that story. God went into the wilderness with its fiery serpent. Remember the bronze serpent story? That's what we're talking about, these two things. Huh? Isaiah? Huh. This is an oracle against the Philistines, basically, if not the Philistines, but their region. Watch out. The serpent's root, root will come forth and adder, and its fruit will be a flying, fiery serpent. We talked about dragons earlier. Um, and one more. Uh, this is an oracle against the Negev, the land of trouble and anguish. The lion is the lion, the adder, the flying, fiery serpent. The word seraph is usually connected to snakes like pit vipers with fiery venom. And that's the word that Scripture uses to describe who is above the throne where God is, and who comes and burns Isaiah. That's also fitting for the one that was thrown down. For one that gets thrown down, absolutely. Absolutely. That's an interesting point. We're glad to come back to that one. You sure so, have not have lost? What did you say? You sure have us not have lost? You know, not entirely sure it's not lost, Terry. That really does fit. This sounds more like lost. This sounds more like the devil than God. Um, there's some etymology about this word, same thing we did with Nephilim. We know some similar Hebrew words, the word burning, uh, sometimes nobleman or aristocrat or fiery serpent. Uh, so, what have I just done? When you think about um, when you think about angels, you usually think about the ones who come and bring messages to mankind. And, and that is the New Testament word. I'm the lost messenger. It's a good word. But has it ever occurred to you that there might be other jobs that they needed to fulfill? And maybe these words aren't all interchangeable. Um, John, would you skip to slide 39 for me? Um, this is from Heiser's book on angels. The term for angel, the term for cherubim, the term for seraphim are not actually interchangeable terms. Our, our hymns sometimes make it sound like an error in the cherubim and seraphim. You know, it sounds like we're just using different words. So, so he just know the Sarah song, uh, you know, all these songs we have. But it sounds like each one of these words is actually a job description of some sort of heavenly being. It sounds like some of them are throne guardians, some of them are messengers, some of them are holiness bodyguards. Huh. John talked about them in the Revelation? There's a hint. Uh, he doesn't spell it out quite the way you like him to, but there's a hint. So, I'm going to stop here because we are, in fact, out of time. But next week, we're going to talk a little bit more about angels. Now that we've laid this foundation to say, we don't actually know what we're talking about most of the time that we talk about angels. By the way, my least favorite thing about this Bible class is, I really think Bible classes need to be productive and help us live better Christian lives. So, my favorite question after Bible class is, so what do you do with this information? I'm not sure what to do with this week. But I want you to be aware of the fact that there is more going on in God's courtroom than you ever think about. And if that's true, when you're going through a season of life where you can see no sense in what's happening and no possible good that can ever happen, I just want you to remember there is more going on than you can see. And that might be super important to help you get through something. So just hang on to that. Roy? The comfort of that is God's still over God is over every one of these things. And sometimes it's easier to see the power of God than you see the power of God over something powerful. Last thing I'll say, then I'll shut up. I've promised you that three times already. If you haven't looked on the church YouTube page, I have uploaded each week's class sessions, video and audio. Uh, you're welcome to get to it there. I try to do that on Tuesday of each week. Some days are early, some days are not late. I think we think about it, but we never ask about it. Yeah, we think about it, but we tend not to ask about it. Thanks for your help. Get out of here. Or stay for the next hour. Whichever you're going to do. See you in a minute.